welcome to this week's Sabbath School lesson. It's a continuation from last week on the story of Lazarus. The title is From Death to Life and the date is August 10, 2013. With the story of Lazarus, the blessing I gained, uh, one of the blessings I gained with studying both last week and this week's lesson was really the display of Christ's wisdom and how he dealt with the whole situation and how how he dealt with it in a long-range view. He wasn't just looking at gratifying uh, the needs or the the um, desires of those requests straight away, but he was laying a foundation that was going to have result great a greater result here uh, thereafter. And so um, we see in last week's lesson his delay when Mary and Martha sent the request. It, it seemed to um, you know, not get the response that they were wanting and Christ didn't really elaborate on the scenario with his disciples and it seemed that Christ perhaps didn't care. But the interesting thing about this week's lesson is the introduction quotation of why some delay happens. It says in the introduction, God does not say, ask once and you shall receive. He bids us ask unwearingly persist in prayer. The persistent asking brings the petitioner into a more earnest attitude and gives him an increased desire to receive the things for which he asks. Christ said to Martha at the grave of Lazarus, If thou wouldst believe, thou shouldst see the glory of God. So you can see here that when Christ works here in the story of Lazarus, but also in our own personal life, that it's not just what we're expecting straight away. God has a far bigger plan and it's f- further reaching than what we think. And so here just the delay can increase our earnestness. We have a better attitude and we even increase the desire that we want. And, and that in itself is an answer to prayer. Whatever our prayer is, but this earnestness, this increase in desire will um, prove to be a greater blessing for us in our, in further in our life. And so Christ comes to the grave, the, the, the scene where Lazarus had died. And I want to just note in question two, the, read the note in question two, in this, the second paragraph, he read the hearts of all assembled. He saw that with many, what passed as a demonstration of grief was only pretense. He knew that some in the company now manifesting hypocritical sorrow would ere long be planning the death not only of the mighty miracle worker, but of the one to be raised from the dead. Christ could have stripped from them their robe of pretended sorrow, but he restrained his righteous indignation. His words, the words he could in all truth have spoken, he did not speak because of the loved one kneeling at his feet in sorrow who truly believed in him. Here again is a great wisdom that Christ shows, this divine intuition where he sees a situation but he sees further than just the hypocritical sorrow. He actually sees souls that couldn't handle such a display if he was to rebuke the uh, hypocrisy of the of the hide mourners, and and so just in that is a big lesson for us to to gain. That sometimes in life we look too closely at the situation. We're looking we're looking at it instead of stepping back and viewing it in a broader situation. In question four, Christ reproved Martha, but his words were spoken with the utmost gentleness. So you can see how he, was, he had more concern about treating people with kindness and gentleness than just sh- merely speaking out the, the, sharp, the sharp words. The words that he spoke, every time he did reprove, it was only with the utmost gentleness. He never needlessly wounded a soul. And so this wisdom that um, he, 
displayed here. It was a great blessing as I looked at this lesson. And also in question five, Christ, another part of his wisdom, in all that he did, Christ was cooperating with the Father. Ever he had been careful to make it evident that he did not work independently. It was by faith and prayer that he wrought his miracles. Christ desired all to know his relationship with his Father. Again, Christ is displaying his wisdom in dealing with this the resurrection. Here were the people that were going to kill him, even plan, plan to kill Lazarus as well. Um, and how he dealt with it was to establish his authority and his position as the Son of God. In question one, it says, In Christ is life, original, unborrowed, underived. He that hath the Son hath life. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. He that believeth in me, said Jesus, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believeth thou this? Christ here looks forward to the time of his second coming. Then the righteous dead shall be raised incorruptible, and the living righteous shall be translated to heaven without seeing death. The miracle which Christ was about to perform in raising Lazarus from the dead would represent the resurrection of all the righteous dead. He who himself was soon to die upon the cross stood with the keys of death, a conqueror of the grave and asserted his right and power to give eternal life. So here Christ is viewing this whole thing not just as oh, someone suffering, there are there are people that need him uh, around. He's actually looking far beyond to the resurrection from, from Abel right to the end. He, he sees things in a bigger picture. And this, I believe, is something we need to really glean from this lesson. That we stand back and view things as a plan. We're not fighting against flesh and blood. There is a battle against good and evil. And we need to consider that more than just the actual physical elements in front of us. And this is illustrated in question three, his broad view of things. Here Christ uh, weeps. He's weeping because of what is going... Not, not because Lazarus has died and not because... Um, uh, you know, that's a sad situation, but he's crying with with human sympathy with Mary and Martha. But he also, it, it goes further than that. It, it's, it's quite re uh, far-reaching. In, in Desire of Ages, the chapter says he, was, he saw the destruction of Jerusalem and he saw the people and how they re were going to reject him, how they were going to perish. And that made him weep also. But here it says, he wept because many of those now mourning for Lazarus would soon plan the death of him who was the resurrection and the life. Others seeking to drop the seed of unbelief into the hearts of those present said derisively, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should have not died? If it were in Christ's power to save Lazarus, why then did he suffer him to die? The weight of the grief of ages was upon him. He saw the terrible effects of the transgression of God's law. He saw that in the history of the world, beginning with the death of Abel, the conflict between good and evil had been unceasing. Looking down the years to come, he saw the suffering and the sorrow, and the sorrow, tears and death that were to be the lot of men. The woes of the sinful race were heavy upon his soul and the fountain of of his tears was broken up as he longed to relieve all their distresses. He saw it in this huge picture and its connection with eternity. Everything we view needs to be connected with humanity. And so his words that he spoke, because he had this broad view of, of eternity, the words that he spoke were jam-packed full of meaning. And Mary and Martha picked up. Many of the things where he will be raised, their mind went straight to the resurrection. Um, but did they comprehend entirely what Jesus' words were meant? It says here in question one, She, 
did not comprehend in all their significance the words spoken by Christ. When I read that and I thought, wow, how many times has Christ spoken to us or his word that we've read and we don't actually comprehend the full significance God has placed in it for us to understand? Because Christ is so wise and he, he views things in such a broad spectrum and he sees the end from the beginning, he knows that every word is truly a seed that will spring up later. He knows that if we take hold of it, we look for an immediate response. God's looking for a long-term response. And, and that long-term effect that, that God looks at, we often over, over miss. And so often when we read the Bible, we're not picking up what we should. Here, the words that Christ spoke were not entirely comprehended. And I don't know about you, but if, 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 where you've studied the Bible and you've gained a real blessing out of a scripture or a, a Bible study that you've done, and then a little while later you'll go back and you'll discover things that you never saw there before. And this is where we're getting into the depth of what Christ is, is speaking to us, where we're comprehending more and more. And it recalled my um, a testimony that, that I can give is, um, a few months ago, I was out prospecting, looking for gold nuggets with my metal detector with my, with my dad. And as we were looking, uh, we found this patch of where some alluvial gold was. And uh, we were picking up some pieces and I decided to pull a chain behind me. So I put a rope and a, and a chain at the end of the rope. So when I walked, the chain would scratch the dirt and I could see exactly, exactly where I went. And so I made a big square and I went through and I sort of followed my mark and then I stepped in a, a detector swing in and kept going around and then closer and closer until I had m covered the whole area with my chain mark, sort of like mowing the lawn when you go around in a circle and you go tighter and tighter. And I picked up six gold nuggets and then my dad said to me, you should go over it again. And I went, no, I'm not going to go over it again. That took me a long time. Um, I'm sure I picked up all the gold there was. And he said to me, you go over it again. If you don't find any more gold, I'll give you one of my gold nuggets. So I thought, oh, okay, well, I've got nothing to lose. So I decided, okay, I'm going to go over it again. So I went over it again, same area, and I picked up seven more nuggets, more than I actually found the first time. And I was... I was I was amazed. I said to my dad, well, you can keep your gold nugget. And, um, and then, although I went over it twice, my dad went over it and he found the biggest nugget, one of the largest nuggets there in that section. And I had walked over it twice and I never picked it up. And it, was, it wasn't a small one. It wasn't like you'd give a small sound on the metal detector. It was, it was quite big. And I... I was like, wow. And when I came back and I recalled the Bible text where it says that we should study the word like the hidden treasure. And I recall that experience that we go over the ground and we're not comprehending everything Christ is actually telling us. And we go over it again and sometimes we get more out of it than we got out of the first time we ever went over it. And then we may even get the biggest blessing when we go over it the third time. And it was such a good object lesson. And when I read this Sabbath school lesson that Mary... Uh, Martha, Mary and Martha did not comprehend in all their significance the words of Christ. I thought, well, they actually um, were. I thought they were quite good at picking up the, that Christ was referring to the resurrection, but there was still more. And I thought, wow, how much am I missing? How much am I missing in my life? Christ is so far-reaching when He speaks, when He acts that there is more to his words than what meets the eye. There's more to it. If we think we know something, we don't know it as we ought to know it. And, um, and so here in question six is the miracle that Christ performs as he um, performs this amazing miracle. He does it in a way where Lazarus was well and truly dead and everyone acknowledged that. Um, he didn't speak to anyone about it, so no one 
Everyone was as surprised as everyone. It wasn't like the disciples knew that there was some secret plan. So it, the way Christ actually did this lesson, and when you go through it, you'll, um, you'll, uh, I'm sure it will jump out at you, that there is such wisdom in Christ. He truly is our wisdom, sanctification, and redemption. So may the Lord bless you as you study the lesson, and let us worship God for His wonderful character at how He does things. And let us emulate him, is my prayer. Amen.